Hello? Hello, everybody. My name is Sinus Lünge, and I am a partner of Effect Architects in, uh, in Copenhagen. I would like to, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here. Thank you, uh, uh, Theo. I can't see you here. But um, I've been following Can Actions for a, for a couple of years, and I'm quite delighted to be uh, invited to come here and speak. And especially, I'm delighted to speak about resiliency, because uh, this is an issue that is increasingly uh, taking up our uh, attention in the office uh, more and more, because we think it's a very uh, uh, sort of uh, crucial topic to uh, to address quite directly. Um, we are located here in uh, in in Denmark, uh, more precisely in uh, in Copenhagen, in the inner part of uh, Copenhagen on Nørrebro. And just this is this is our office. This is uh, this is where I work every day. We are around 40 architects and urban planners and a uh, few landscape architects also uh, working in the office now. We started up in uh, 2007, uh, me and another partner, and have been building up the office doing uh, projects within Denmark, but also uh, more and more internationally. We work within urban planning and architecture uh, at the same, uh, and, and everything in between. <coughs> so. Uh, our name, Effect, actually mean, means impact. And uh, we call ourselves Effect because we wanted to measure every project on the impact that the project would have on the surroundings. So in many cases, that's the social effect of, of architecture of our projects. Or it could be the environmental or even the economic uh, uh, impact that the project or, uh, or economic effect that the project would have on the surroundings. But uh, on every project, we ob obviously try to, to balance the, the three in, in different ways, and we do that in, in, in different scales and in different projects. What I'm going to show you today is five to six projects <coughs> exemplifying how we uh, how we work and and handle these different uh, impacts of of our projects. But I'm going to to start with the with the really big picture um, of this, which I think is is uh, the sort of main design challenge that we uh, that we have uh, before us in in our generation. This is. Uh, the biggest design job is to uh, to find out how we keep uh, this planet uh, with the same amount of livability and quality as we uh, took it over from from our parents. Um, and you might ask if that's actually a, a design task. And I, I think it's really it really is about design. It really is problems that we can manage and and handle with uh, design. Because basically the uh, the global changes and the, the changes in, in the uh, environment and, and climate that we are experiencing, they are the result of every part of of, uh, of the life that we know. I suppose you know this uh, uh, these curves showing the the great acceleration of uh, of of our global society. It's everything from the growth in world population to the water use to the amount that we transport ourselves, to the loss of, uh, of, of forest zones, uh, to the nitrogen that we lead out into our oceans. Uh, you, know, you know all these uh, sort of uh, hockey, hockey stick uh, diagrams. But basically, I think when you put all these together, it's actually a quite scary image. And I really do believe that, uh, that it's our generation, it's our task to, to try to, uh, to balance out the way that we our money and, and, and spend our life. 66% uh, of our environmental impact is related to where we live and, and, uh, and what we eat. So it's sort of the household uh, uh, consumption. So 66%. And we spend one third of our income paying for the same uh, house including the consumption of energy, electricity, heating, cooling, water, etc. So all the work, all the hard labor we put in, we pay that back into to, to our home. So this whole sort of cycle of, of, of value is, is kind of a, 
is a bit weird actually. So, so we started sort of with this simple question. What if, if, if you have a home that will actually work for you, so you don't have to work so hard for your home? What if the home was actually providing organic food, clean water, and, and energy, just like that as a service? And you get more spare time to spend with your kids, your wife, or your tomatoes, or yourself, or a good book. So we looked at this uh, uh, system, which is based on, uh, on technologies that are already sort of uh, working and, and existing. You have the home in the middle, producing waste that will then be used in a biogas uh, uh, plant that will produce energy. The waste can also go to some livestock and uh, soldier flies. This is an insect farm that is part of this uh, loop. So the insects become food for fish, and the waste from the livestock becomes uh, a fertilizer for, for the garden. And the waste or the feces from the fish is working with an aquaponic system. So this is a closed loop with fish water and, uh, and, and greenhouses, which is a very efficient and organic way to, to grow food. Uh, so the water from the fish will, uh, will feed the, the greenhouse, and the greenhouse and the seasonal gardens will produce food for the home. And also you can eat the fish and, and, uh, and the livestock. Water is collected, stored, and uh, even the biogas is also producing wastewater that goes into the grey water tanks that can then also work as fertilizer for the garden. Um, other parts of the water would go to the aquaponics. Solar gain would go to a power grid that also gains power from the biogas system. And uh, that will also be uh, the power for the, uh, for the electrical uh, vehicles of the city. So we actually went through this a few times uh, with the right scales, with engineers, and there's nothing in this model that doesn't sort of technical, technically work. It's a difficult business case to do, and it's difficult to get the, the scale working, and it's also difficult to get the legislation. Normally, when you buy a house, you only buy for the brick. You only buy the bricks and the plot. You're not buying all the systems producing energy, food, and everything else. You have to buy that elsewhere. So to completely change that business case is, as it turns out, quite uh, quite complex. But the technical system is feasible and it and it works. So right now we are trying to get this uh, first prototype built in Elmia in in Holland, and and the first design, which is a prototype design, looks like this. So it's 24, 25 different houses. And then you have the sort of most intensive food production in the center of the village. So this is also the sort of uh, center of, of community. So this is also where you have all the social spaces uh, in the center. Like we did the whole design, so everything is actually designed within greenhouses because we thought it would be nice if you're not only growing food in sort of big industrial greenhouses, but you can also grow food in the little winter gardens uh, in your own house. So the infrastructure and all the sort of uh, common spaces, because the social part of this is really quite uh, important. We think that the, the size of this community is pretty important, because if you're around 25 families working here, <coughs> you don't want to have some like really low paid African immigrants working here to produce the food for the rest of the society. That's how it is today. Like if it's a small community, you want everybody to, to feel well. So basically the, the, the principle of being, having everything close by is that you will watch that the tomatoes are grown in a nice way. You will watch that the people who are growing the tomatoes are also sort of uh, feeling well. So the idea of this is not that it's a big community and everybody is farmers. It's really a service, so somebody inside the village or from the outside will be paid to a farm, and the rest of the community will receive every day a small sort of box of uh, freshly local uh, 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 food products on the doorstep every morning. 
that's the business case of, of our client, region, uh, region villages. So this sort of quite uh, um, uh, intense uh, growing inside, you can actually have the space to have uh, biodiversity and seasonal uh, farming on, on the outside. So the inside of, of, uh, of the village is uh, sort of not an industrial food production. It's somewhere in between uh, sort of your own greenhouse in the garden or and, and sort of a, a bigger bigger system. But basically it's quite important that you have these social spaces where you can meet and sit. The food is produced in seasonal gardens, in greenhouses, in heated greenhouses and in aquaponics. And the aquaponics are the most sort of efficient uh, uh, growing system. They work like this, that you have fish in a tank and it's a closed uh, circle and you cannot put any chemicals in it because then the fish will die. So it has to be organic, basically. So you take the water from the fish and that's just fed like hydroponics directly to the plants. So they're growing in, in the water and it's a very, very efficient way of, uh, of growing. In fact, you can reduce the, the, the sort of uh, footprint of, uh, of growing with 98% uh, and, um, and only use 10% of, uh, of the water that you'd use on a regular field. The greenhouses that we are planning are basically winter gardens for, for all the homes so that you'll have inside your home, you'll have this sort of preheated uh, uh, area here where you can uh, grow food. So this is obviously a concept that will only work for the northern hemisphere. If you go further south, this will be too, uh, too warm. But for, for countries like Denmark and Holland and uh, and, and Scandinavia, it's really sort of stretching the season of being able to, to come outside and, uh, and be in the garden. So inside that you have a dry house, but that's where you have the sort of uh, real climate screen for the house. But we wanted to bring the sort of uh, planting inside so you, ha you can here have, uh, have uh, lemons or, or oranges or something that you couldn't normally grow in a, in a Dutch uh, garden. So basically we're trying to move away from the sort of uh, ego model to the to the eco model where we, we sort of bring back a good sort of uh, uh, a good and healthy relationship between the the people and all the ecosystems that uh, that, that they engage with so that's uh, the the region villages and uh, we're just putting it on a, on the Venice Biennale uh, now and starting to uh, release the the press we still not have we we still don't have the financing for the first uh, model, but it's going pretty well. So I really uh, believe that we are going to build this in uh, in Elmia within the next uh, few years, and we'll make sure that uh, we'll put it in the media when we do so. So that's region villages. The next project is also kind of a, a crazy project that we uh, involved in in. Uh, on our own terms, this is a, a project that we just couldn't help ourselves uh, stepping into. This is Copenhagen, and uh, Copenhagen is very much defined by the harbor going straight through the city. Um, so part of it is an island, and this is actually the ocean uh, going through. And ever since Copenhagen was established, it was defined by the city, by the by the water, and by the life that was uh, around the water. This is the old uh, uh, fish market. They used to be uh, sort of very heavily populated with uh, with fishing boats and and in the summertime and mornings uh, a big market also. <coughs> in the last century, uh, industrialization started to completely take over the harbor front, and for a period of time we had big warehouses and and factories along the whole harbor front. So. No longer it was a place for the public uh, to come and, and thrive. But then in the 80s, there were big uh, riots because you had uh, a few accidents. Chloros uh, coming out uh, into the neighborhoods and all the residents came out and they wanted uh, the municipality to close down the factories. So then the municipality of Copenhagen did something quite brave. They said, we are moving away the industry and we are going to clean the harbor and we're going to give the people uh, the harbor front back. So this is actually the same area that, that is on this image here. It became this sort of people's uh, park, 
and uh, this is where we have the uh, the harbor bath that is now this kind of uh, social icon of, uh, of of Copenhagen. So what they started out with uh, 15 to 20 years ago, cleaning up the harbor, is now actually uh, creating a, a big value for the city. So you think that the hero or the you, you think that the sort of the ingenious uh, part of this is is the architecture of of the harbor bath and uh, and all these icons but actually and that's i think it's a quite important point about danish architecture it's often also because the politicians are good at pushing really good uh, projects so these we have a lot of harbor bath now in in the in in the in the center part of the harbor but they're only made possible because the politicians decided to clean up the harbor so we can swim in it so today the, the water is, is really clean and uh, the harbor front is used for all different types of, uh, of recreation. And uh, a few years ago we found this article. Um, these two geeses wanted to grow oysters in the, in the Copenhagen Harbor. And we thought that was a brilliant idea because you really have a lot of water coming in and out so it's, uh, it's very clean. So they started out with this uh, very small farm in the middle of the of the harbor. Now, we decided that we decided to give them a call and, and ask if we shouldn't help them with the architecture around uh, that oyster farm. So we looked into well, they said yes, they would like us to do that. So we looked into how you knew normally would would produce oysters, and it's basically this infrastructure where you can't really see the the product. So we wanted to change that into sort of a, a full fledged uh, place where you could see the production, but you could also uh, spend time on the ocean. You could combine it with water sports and culture. And, uh, and that became this sort of uh, concept of making a harbor farm for various different types of products, oysters, mussels, uh, potentially also uh, fish. <coughs> so our idea was to do this sort of uh, platform on top. They don't need any sunlight, they just need the water. I mean, it's like basically you have a cow on a field, and instead of moving the cow from field to field, the field is moving below the cow because it's just the water coming coming through. So they just sit there and 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 uh, eat out of the the water. So what we suggested was to do this sort of social platform on top of this production, with cafe, uh, a learning lab, and uh, and various facilities. And we don't know yet where to put it in the harbor, so we made a system that is kind of flexible to be located in, in different places and maybe even shipped around. And as it goes now, there are several municipalities who are sort of uh, probing to get uh, one of these in, in different sizes in, in, in Denmark. But we still haven't built one of them, though. But the idea is basically that you have this sort of uh, social platform on the top, um, where you have education, dining, maintenance, and maintenance and, and recreation, and then underneath you have uh, the farm, so you can have seaweed, mussels, oysters, and and fish. So it's a little bit like uh, a small farm that would sell out of the the backyard. And uh, the idea is to to have uh, both sort of uh, urban farming combined with uh, with serving of oysters and champagne and, uh, and education and uh, recreation and also sort of a platform for water sports and, 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 uh, and culture. So today the two geezers are already uh, uh, actually doing a lot of this but they, uh, they still haven't found the, the finances to do the big, uh, the big platform here. But, uh, but the oyster production is ongoing and uh, they have uh, venues, they have a sort of uh, program for school classes to come and, and help them, uh, them farm and they are now fundraising to, to build the platform here. So now I'm going to show you a few projects that is more about the sort of uh, social side of, uh, of uh, resilience. Um, the three projects that we, uh, that we built and the first one is called Liusrum. Is meaning uh, life space. It's a cancer uh, consulting center. So for, for uh, cancer patients that have a diagnosis and are under treatment, they're often in a quite hard time. Some of them are dying and some of them are like seriously ill. So they need, aside from the clinical treatment, also uh, a place to get sort of, uh, to, to socialize with other uh, patients to come spend time with their family and help and, and, and try to get through uh, the illness. 
Now, in Denmark, they wanted to copy the, the concept of the Maggie centers that they had been working with in, uh, in, in, in Britain and, and the States for a while. The Maggie centers was uh, started by Charles Jenks, uh, named after his wife, and the point was to get like really famous architects to do uh, cancer centers. As it turned out, they asked uh, Frank Gehry to do the first one in Denmark, and it became like insanely expensive, and uh, the users were not happy. They just thought it was completely stupid architecture, even though it was a star architect. So the, the cancer organization thought about, wh what are we doing here? We cannot spend our money like this on a super famous star architect who didn't like really provide the, the quality. So we are going to do something different. We are going to ask the young architects of Denmark to team up with, uh, with constructors, and then they have to do super cheap, high-performing cancer centers in, in Denmark. So that was the concept. And we got this uh, site uh, alongside this huge modernistic uh, hospital. You can see this is where the treatment is going on. It's not a very nice place. It's not a place you want to socialize or basically talk. It's very sort of functional. And what they wanted was really to have this uh, 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 place where you could have uh, other types of uh, aspects of, of the clinical uh, treatment, places where you could talk and, and socialize. So that was, uh, in short, the program. So we decided to try to do a place that was not an institution that did not like look like a hospital, but actually, uh, in fact, looked more like a home. So there's kind of this uh, social design of saying, let's try to do something that will be as cozy as coming into somebody's living room where you re really want to feel like, uh, like staying. Um, so this is the site. Here you have the hospital up here. And uh, the little side is here. You have a quite big street here and this neighborhood of, uh, of villas uh, around. So we wanted to sort of tap into the villa typology. And the first thing we did was to kind of break down this big program into seven small units. And then we put them together like sort of a villages of, of, uh, of small houses, each with one function. And in the middle, we put these two courtyards where you have uh, protected outdoor areas with greenery and light coming into the house, as you can see here. Uh, so in each of the, of the different houses, you have different functions. So in here is the, uh, the, the lobby or the, uh, the entrance room. And then you have uh, library, consulting, uh, treatments, art center, the administration, and uh, a gym. In short, and everything is, is connected in this uh, circulation with this sort of central uh, space that we call the life space in the center. And that is uh, basically the, the plan there. There you see the house. Looks like the model, little white boxes. <coughs> and um, well, the plan is quite simple. You have all these different functions, but they're bound together by the common sort of uh, circulation. So there you see sort of in, uh, in, in, in model how the, the project is sort of filled with little diverse spaces that actually uh, uh, looks like these uh, seven small houses put together. Oh, there's a few images of this coming up. So the entrance was done in, in wood to actually make this sort of uh, extra warm and, and welcoming uh, entrance space. And when you, once you come inside, you come into this sort of uh, living room. So we didn't want to do a reception. So the people working in this reception, they'd be sitting here with coffee and, and, and newspapers. So you come in and you can sit down and, and, and have a chat and then find out uh, what you want to do in the house. So it's basically the idea is that you, that you come there and you feel like uh, hanging out. And it's working quite well because it's the, the, the house is completely booked also by the other uh, staff of, of, uh, of the big hospital who would rather have their meetings and everything in, in this house. So here you can see in the section the diversity of, of small spaces uh, throughout the house. This is the courtyard and this is the, the hallway. You can see how the courtyard is, is, uh, is working for celebrations and uh, and activities, and also as this sort of simple uh, sense garden where you can uh, hang out and, and, and cool down if you need so. So basically, we did this. 
project with so many different sizes of spaces, so you would always feel a space that would have the size of the mood that you were in. So you can be together, or you can be alone, or you can be two by two. And uh, some of it is like these little niches built into the to the library here, where you can sit and, and have a conversation uh, in intimacy. This little bit, this little small project, it's 800 square meters, and it was a quite cheap uh, square meter price. Actually, it won the building of the years of of uh, Architizer in uh, in 15, which was a complete surprise because that's uh, voted by architects from from all over the world. But uh, but somehow it. Uh, they beat all the big hospitals uh, for this price, which we are quite uh, proud of, of course. Um, the next project is also a, a smaller project that we have uh, uh, just opened up in, uh, in January this year. It's called Street Mecca. <coughs> and it's a project for a new type of, of, uh, of sports institution in Denmark uh, for street sports, for skateboarding, street basket, Futsal and uh, street dance and uh, and um, and all the like DJing and all these activities that are related to to street culture, because we are experiencing in Denmark that the young people they don't want to play foo football two times a week or handball, they want to do other stuff. They want to hang out with their friends. So basically, they're not doing so much sports anymore. So. And at the same time, you have the sort of curve of, of skateboarding. It's just the most sort of uh, exponentially growing sport in, in the world. Uh, and in Denmark, the growth in, in unorganized sport is, is quite big. So there's this foundation called uh, Game. We wanted to, to test if you could do this sort of new sports uh, institution. And we were invited to, to take part in one of these uh, competitions. So we were uh, asked to do the design in this uh, existing building. It's an old sort of uh, turntable uh, train yard. And uh, all that was left over were these uh, two houses. And this is the, the oldest buildings in uh, this quite new city called, uh, called Espia. So the municipality really wanted to keep the buildings, even though they were in a quite poor condition. This is uh, how it used to, to, to work for trains to be repaired. And this is how it was sort of developed over time and uh, till the time when we took it over. It was only these two buildings to get to back. So the idea in the competition was actually to revitalize these two buildings into heated spaces. But we thought that was a really bad idea because they were very worn down and there's wooden constructions on the inside and it would cost a fortune to do that. So we suggested, why don't leave them like they are and then build some new houses and use them as sort of outdoor spaces. And that's basically how we won the, the competition. So the program was basket, uh, hockey space, uh, all these different little functions for street sports um, that we put into to these asphalt maker, yellow box, brick maker, lounge maker, dance maker, concrete maker. And we put them sort of en suite so they would have sort of uh, the street on the outside. But since it was this kind of round uh, structure, we just put it into the existing and, and, and wrap the rest so you have this uh, quite nice uh, central space in the middle. And that we could sort of continue the work with the construction that was al already sort of uh, a strong identity to the site. And keep the idea of these sort of uh, open uh, factory doors that would completely open up to, uh, to the outside so that outside and inside could completely melt together in, in the summer times. So this is uh, the competition proposal that we uh, that we won. The plan here, you can see the outdoor skates, the street soccer, the dance hall, the lounge, and the uh, street skate uh, facility here. A few elevations of the different spaces, and this is how it uh, looked at uh, at the opening. Now, uh, yeah, and this is this is the inside. So this is the space we wanted to keep. This completely sort of raw uh, factory hall that's kind of cool if you're a skater, and it's it's kind of a beautiful space. You don't want to clad this with the uh, insulation on the inside. So we we're quite happy that we managed to keep it uh, uh, like this. And some of the new buildings that are equally uh, raw and and uh, sort of uh, sort of as as they were built. Industrial. The backside. 
and uh, we developed this with the skaters of, of, uh, of this uh, little city. So we invited them in uh, on an early stage. Some of them were already there because they were doing graffiti inside the, the building. Um, but we invited them into the building and, and we had this uh, workshop where we tried to sort of uh, get them to tell us what they wanted out of the, the site. And we did that in, uh, in Lego. And it was quite fun because they're not used to coming to workshops and, 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 and participate uh, like this, this, these uh, kids. But they built these uh, quite cool ideas and that we turned into actually real uh, furniture designs at the end of the process. So we ended up building the furniture with uh, the kits on site uh, before the inauguration. So then, I mean, the whole city came to, to the opening, which was quite uh, a great expectation. And even just four months after the, uh, the opening, this is already the largest sports club in, uh, in the city. It's the third at the fourth biggest city in, in, in Denmark. So it's uh, insane how this new type of, uh, of, of, of street culture and street sport is just sort of taking over the old uh, sports facility and how you can actually make a completely different space for a sports institution than, than the one we are used to, to see. So now there are two new competitions in, in Denmark for similar spaces and uh, the organization games are moving internationally also to Lebanon to, to do projects like this. And just two days ago, we received a mail from a woman in South Africa who said that she wanted this in her neighborhood because there were no hope for her kids and they were doing bad stuff on the streets and they wanted to have a place where they could uh, do sports and hang out. So we put her in contact with the, uh, with the organizers and hope that uh, there will also be a project in, in South Africa. The last project that I'm quickly going to show you is, is a little bit similar. It's a project that we did with a Danish television. Uh, so it was basically a TV program and a project. So it had to be done in only four months over a summer. The idea was to put four teams of architects in four different cities and see what you could manage in, uh, in, in, in four months over a summer and how you could sort of uh, engage the local community in building something. So it's called Build It Up. And we came to uh, this little uh, city of 7,000 inhabitants in the northern part of Denmark. It's a city that is shrinking. We did this uh, uh, skate park that you can see here. So I'm just going to tell you the, the story of, of how we got it built. Like this, was, this is our client. This is uh, the, the kids of, of this city who uh, managed to, uh, to um, persuade the national uh, television of Denmark that uh, they should be one of the site. There were 800 applications from all over Denmark with different projects. So they became one of the four. So we took our car and drove the eight hours to, to meet these guys. And they had this kind of really lousy place uh, for skating uh, <laughs> on the harbor front. So we thought we were going, I mean, couldn't be worse than, than this. And the first thing was that we had a battle with the mayor who, who came sort of, he was suddenly in the media and he didn't really think about, uh, everybody was super proud about these uh, little kids. But the mayor didn't want to have uh, this skate park in, on his harbor front. So finally, we got this quite uh, toxic uh, place on, uh, that was sort of uh, out of use to turn that into uh, to a skate park. So it was 80, 80 by 20 meters. And we decided quickly that we wanted to do both skates, and, but also like a real park for the, for the city. So it was not only for the, for the 50 kids with, with skateboards. So in short, what we did was to create these uh, skate loops, uh, this kind of romantic park for skateboarders, uh, where we then shaped all the edges so it would become sort of a perfect flow for, for skaters to move in. And we had uh, workshops uh, with the kids. I'm not going to go too deep into to that, but they had a lot of wishes, wishes for, for skate obstacles that we sort of included in, in the landscape all the way around. And then the surrounding part, we, we sort of kept that for the city to decide and, and to come up with, uh, with ideas. So we wondered how to get in contact with these sort of 7,000 people in, in this uh, little uh, area. And we put articles in the newspapers saying, like, please call us or mail us if you have any ideas. And we got a few mails and a few calls, and it didn't really work out. 
Then we made a Facebook uh, page, and like in very short time, we had 2,000 people of the city following. So then we could just ask, does anybody want to help us with uh, a playground? And then the blacksmith, the carpenter, everybody else called us. So at the end of the day, we had this sort of uh, co-creation with local companies, with the school kids, with the uh, people from the city, to actually everybody sort of stepped in and, and helped building this park. <coughs> which was, I tell you, a really amazing experience as an architect to not just work with the sort of uh, nasty, angry uh, contractors, but to work with the people who were actually building their own park was a, was a big experience. So everybody was, uh, was, was engaged here. These are the, the, the skate crew. This is a professional crew that came from Canada to actually shape the concrete. So those guys were paid, and the rest were almost sort of uh, free work. We even, uh, yeah, this, these are the American students, uh, interns that we had on the team, raising uh, the, uh, the, the flagpole in the middle of the, of the park. We even have children's labor uh, engaged also. The policeman was also there, so we didn't get arrested. So this is how it, uh, it, it came out at the, the day just before opening, sort of uh, beautifully nice concrete, but the biggest experience was actually to see the whole city coming there to celebrate uh, the opening. It, it was that, that was breathtaking and very touching. So this is the mayor, and uh, there were almost 2,000 people there opening uh, the park, and as you can see, finally, the mayor got to love the project with his city, so we celebrated together at the end. And um, I mean, that, that day, seeing these sort of 2,000 people and, and all these uh, skaters uh, go into that park, I think was probably the biggest experience that I had in, in my work life. Also because the city that is shrinking, they just suddenly had something to celebrate. And one year later, when there was a huge uh, storm, the whole thing was flooded and uh, the soil was uh, taken out and, and the plants. But two weeks later, the same people came back and they rebuilt uh, the park. And that's, I think, some sort of uh, resilience, that you have a local community that are so dedicated to their public spaces that they rebuild it when it comes down. Normally in Denmark, you'd expect the municipality to do that. So that's a very good uh, experience. And finally, the, the project made it, made it to the front page of the Danish uh, architecture policy called uh, the People in Center. So this is the, the policy for, for architecture nationally in, uh, in, in Denmark. And it's, it says something about the political focus on working with uh, people as a way to create uh, sustainable uh, projects that uh, create a value for, for the cities and not only the, the developers. Thank you. Okay, there's time for a few questions, I think, if uh, anybody has some. Поднимайте руку, я підходжу до вас з мікрофоном. I have a very simple question. What would you do without Danish politicians? I, I think you cannot underestimate the value of, uh, of the policies that surround the Danish uh, architecture. I think, I actually think the Danish architects are quite uh, forward thinking when it comes to sustainability. If it's energy efficiency in buildings, if it's uh, inclusion or social agendas, or if it's uh, uh, social housing, there's a quite holistic approach to architecture. And I really truly believe that it's also because we have politicians that, uh, that ask the right questions, that put money aside for the right things. But so relating to that, uh, you, s you mentioned this project in South Africa. And um, like, how do you imagine that? Like, basically um, taking what you do as a practice, but bringing it somewhere where there's no support, basically. I have no idea. It's actually the, the, the organization called GAME. 
are starting to do international works where they do different kinds of, of fundraising, and I don't know how they fundraise, if it's UN or what they do, but uh, it's, it's, I don't know, to be honest. Hello. Uh, what's your aim? What's your dream? Well, I, I think when we are doing a project like the one with uh, region villages, that, that's a project where we have potentially, uh, we could have quite a big impact because it's not to be done only for the rich people in, in Holland. That's the first sort of uh, place to build and then it's supposed to be sort of uh, developed also in the developing countries. So that's, I think, a project where you can really see uh, how architecture can make a really positive uh, change to society. And basically, well, we, do, we really love doing cool design like every other architect, but we, we really, basically, uh, we're quite happy when we feel that there's a content that can really make a difference. So that's sort of uh, the professional dream that, that we work with in, in our company. Hi, do you have any plans for integrating the region villages into already existing cities or are they to be built in empty plots? No, no, it's uh, super relevant to, to think about because what you see in, in Denmark, as in many other uh, uh, countries, is that people are moving from the countryside and into the city. And it's very expensive to move into the city and the countryside is a very sort of cheap uh, land to acquire. So it's very relevant and it's something that we're really thinking about uh, how region villages could be helped to... Uh, refurbish uh, villages that are being sort of uh, left over by people moving away. So it's very relevant. Thanks for the presentation. And I have some question. Uh, uh, have you done some research um, in term um, uh, how many people do want to live in such, help, uh, such kind of uh, houses like you're present in a uh, village? <coughs> Thanks. Uh, no, we, we haven't done that uh, research. What I think what we assume is that uh, all people are different. And in Denmark, there's an old saying that because of the difference of taste, everybody will get married. And I think that's a little bit the same with architecture. You shouldn't try to sort of look too, too hard to find out if there's a market. If you believe in it, I'm sure there's a market. It might be narrow, but I'm sure that there will be some people who would like to, to live like that. At the moment, there's a lot of people sort of uh, calling in to region villages to, to let them know that they would like to live in a village like that. So that's not, that doesn't mean that they're going to buy a house. But there's a big interest, so I believe there's a market. <laughs> 